Well, let me just uh, remind you here that uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. I don't remember how many. Uh, I guess I do have a date here. I, I pulled this back up uh, the 15th of the month. We looked at love one another. And if you look at uh, 1 John chapter 4, look at verse 7 and 8. And we're going to go back and review some of this here. But uh, verse 7 of 1 John chapter 4, the Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Now, I have to just stop right there because... Uh, I was asked a question, and boy, that question has uh, stuck with me ever since Kathleen asked me this question. Uh, I thought that was profound. At the end of the service, we were talking a little bit, and she asked the question, are we to love one another or are we to love all people? Because I was certainly broadening it beyond just the scope of what Scripture says here. The scope of Scripture says, beloved, it's addressed to Christians by way of that phrase. And then the very next exhortation is, let us love one another in the context it technically is dealing with believers in Christ and that we have a responsibility to love the brethren is, is really uh, the correct way of interpreting this scripture. Would we do an injustice to the word of God to expand that? And I would say, I don't think we would. Technically speaking, it is addressing Christians. But what about those that are outside of the family of God? Are we to love them? And the answer to that is, yes, we are. We're to love all people. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. That's certainly love for those, the, the brothers and sisters in Christ. But people can see that, and as we reach out to the family of God, we ought to have that love for people beyond the family of God. And so love is a powerful tool, and I, I don't think it's limited to just the, the Christians. But I will say this. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the emphasis of Scripture is for this reason. Uh, maybe there's a reason that we are exhorted to love one another. Sometimes it's hard to love those that are really close to us because we know them very well. Uh, we, know, we know the good, the bad, and the ugly about people. And uh, sometimes, uh, because of our sinful nature or human nature, sometimes all we can focus on is the negative. And so we know certain things about each other that are sitting here today and maybe those that aren't with us. And, and so uh, you, you can maybe in your mind say, well, boy, it's easy to love that person because they're very lovely people. But, well, these, well, no, they're a little more, no, no, brethren, let us love one another. And that love, again, is taken to a whole different level. This is the new commandment that Christ has given us, new because, again, of the example that Christ set. Uh, his love was incredible love. And so it is the, the kind of love that we are to have for the brethren. And I would, again, extend it beyond even uh, the, 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 the church family or those that are born into the family of God. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. But the text would go on to say, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And I'm going to come back to that by way of the message today. But by way of review, we looked at a couple things in that text alone. We looked at the command to love. And uh, it's not optional, and you'll hear that again this morning. Uh, we are commended to love. Uh, God commended his love toward us. In other words, he again demonstrated, he proved he entrusted his love to us by way of the example of his son, things that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But then what we got into was some examples of this love and what love is and what love isn't. And that's why I want to reiterate this, because we don't often maybe focus on some of the ugly. But love does not bite, devour, gossip, or talk down. And so I just want, to th I want you to think about your love for the brethren, your love for other people, uh, in the last two weeks, just two weeks, because that's when we talked about this subject, two weeks ago, uh, how has your love been demonstrated? How have you demonstrated love for others? Did you bite, devour, gossip, or talk down with regard to other people? If you did, that's not depicting love. Uh, there should be no bitterness, anger, malice, or hatred. Uh, the book of Galatians says, If you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Uh, there's some serious warnings against treating brethren in a wrong fashion. Love is not to be selfish. It is not to be focused on me. Too often we are so wrapped up in our own lives and in my circle, my sphere of influence, and it's really about me and my life and my schedule and my family and where I'm going, and it's I and me and my, and, and yet love is beyond me and my. It's, it's, it's beyond us. So think about your love in the last couple of weeks since we were reminded of this truth. How has your love been demonstrated beyond yourself and your sphere of influence? How have you demonstrated love to other people? 
uh, is, there, is there any of that evidence in your life? Or is it, again, all about you and your world and your happening and your agenda and your schedule and me, me, my, my, I, I? That's not love. Love is, again, beyond us. So much of our love is self-centered. It's selfish. And so I hope and pray that it's not wrapped up in our own affairs. Uh, somebody has said that love is not to be indifferent all right, so here's where we're sometimes guilty. Indifferent is that we could kind of be passive with our love. We wouldn't deny that we don't love people or that we do love people. We would just kind of be in between. It's like, well, I really didn't have opportunity or I really didn't, uh, I really didn't go out of my way. It's not that I didn't love them. It's not that I did love them. It's just that I'm indifferent to people. I think, again, somebody has said this, that the greatest enemy of brotherly love is not hatred but indifference. We just, we just don't have the time of day. We're just, we're just not consumed with others. We're just, well, I got to go. I got, I got this to do. I got that to do. And I, I want a tight schedule. And I don't, where has your love gone beyond, again, ourselves? Love certainly lifts others. It listens to others. It is not to be hypocritical. It talks about unfeigned love in, in 1 Peter. Uh, it is to be of a pure heart. That means it is to be clean. It is to be not, again, self-centered. It is to be fervent. Fervent means that it is hot. It's boiling over. It is evident. Uh, you shouldn't have to question somebody's love, that they really do love you. I, I would hope that if somebody asked a question about so-and-so, and they said, well, do you think they love me? I, I would hope that there would be no, no questions asked. Of course they do. Is it, of course, because intellectually you're telling yourself that, or is it true because they have demonstrated love? You know they love you. They, they have, and, if, and if you have asked for the example, well, well, here and here and here and this and that, and, and so there's evidence of that love. And so I would hope and pray that it is fervent love. It is love that is stretched. And then we took that a little bit further, and we went on to saying that it certainly is revealed by way of helping people in time of need, and uh, I know that we've had opportunities to do that, even within our own church family in the last couple of weeks. We're to pray for each other. That's a demonstration of our love. Who have you prayed for? Think about it again. Here's where I go, folks. And maybe I'm just, um, I'm just too practical, but I really, I really, I don't like theory. I, I mean, there's a place for it. I like practicality. I like, I like, I like the rubber meeting the road. I like, to, I like to be able to take Scripture and say, how does that really affect me? So, so if I really love others and... I want to demonstrate, who have you prayed for beyond yourself this last two weeks, beyond your family and your immediate needs? Have you prayed for people that are sitting around you, people that have needs uh, that, that you know within the body of Christ that, that really, again, could use some prayer and support and encouragement? Who have you prayed for beyond that? I, I hope and pray that you, you could sit there with a clean conscience and say, well, praise God. You're not boasting, but in your heart you say, well, no, I prayed for this one and that one and that one, and, and, and they're not part of my church and they're part of my immediate family, and, and, uh, and I really maybe don't know all about them, but I know that they have some needs, and so I, I'm privileged and honored to be able to intercede on their behalf and lift them to the throne of grace, and so I pray for this person and that person. Oh, okay, then you have demonstrated love. Uh, you can certainly encourage others. Who have you encouraged beyond, again, the immediate circle? Who have you encouraged? Uh, we we're talking, uh, I was talking to Alice uh, Furman here this morning, and, and uh, she had a dear friend pass away and, and uh, some concerns. And I said, well, one of the things you could do is maybe just write a letter to that individual or to the remaining family and, and just let them know that you're thinking of praying. And she said, I already did that. I said, praise the Lord. That's good. That's encouraging other people. That's what you, that's, listen, God has you in this world for a reason, folks. And it's not to be about you. It's about him. And, and, and the sooner we can really get a hold of that truth and, and begin to understand that this, this involves a lot of things, a lot of people. It's huge. It's bigger than us. And so, so God has allowed Alice in this world for 80 plus years to be a blessing and an encouragement to other people still. And some of that is just pick up a pen and a piece of paper and send off a note. That's great. That's why God says, hey, be light, be salt in this world. And folks, when we stop shining and when we have no flavor, we're to no avail. So, so I want to continue to shine. I want to continue to influence people's lives. Uh, we can certainly restore the fallen. And uh, again, people can be overtaken in a fault. And uh, from time to time, we come alongside and help them. We can certainly use our homes and our vehicles and, and things of that sort to be hospitable uh, to other individuals. We can exercise forgiveness. These are all different ways that we can demonstrate 
love. Love one another. And so I hope and pray that you've been able to act on some of those. And uh, by God's grace, again, then you are a powerful testimony and witness to the world in which we live. Today, I want to I deal with the same subject, love. I'm simply going to call it the marvel of love. The marvel of love. And the word marvel simply means the wonder or the amazement of love. Um, you know, again, I, as I put a title on there and I began to think about it, what is it that you marvel at in our world today? Is there anything that you are simply amazed at? Now, that again, uh, I've had a little bit more time to think on it, so I'll give you a couple things that I've come up with here. But uh, I think uh, we are studying in our evening services. We're not going to study it tonight, but we have been for the last uh, several months. The marvels of, of uh, creation, the marvels of creation, uh, the created order, the, the, the God that brought all of this world into existence. I mean, we've looked at ants and spiders and uh, bees and and uh, we've looked at uh, different things that are in, in nature, trees, and just, just how did all that happen? Uh, you can then take it, as we have done in our study, and, and move from the marvels of just simple creation to the human body. Uh, just take a part of your body, any part of your body, and just think on it. Think on things that you and I would just take for granted, the, a skin, the, the largest organ in our body, our skin. Phenomenal how God has given us skin for a reason, for a purpose, and uh, how well it is designed uh, with, with the ability to be like elastic. It, it stretches and moves and, and protects. And if we didn't have it, we'd be vulnerable to all kinds of diseases and on and on. Just skin. Just talk about skin. Talk about the hair on your head. Whatever. The human body is phenomenal. It's amazing. It's a marvel, the human body. You can look at a number of those things. You can look at kids. Sometimes we often talk about our kids. And I, I marvel at the resiliency of kids. Do you know kids are resilient? They, they just, much more so than we adults. Kids literally bounce back. I mean, kids can be, as it were, you know, emotionally beat down, as it were, sometimes. And yet they can kind of just rise back up. Now, that's not to say that they don't carry some scars through life. But, but I marvel at kids uh, physically, emotionally. Kids can take an awful lot. You and I, as adults, we don't, we don't recover quite like kids can. They are resilient. Kids just bounce, as it were. And uh, when you look at it, I just I think, wow, that's, that's an incredible design that, uh, that you have given us, Lord. Look at God, the marvels of God. On and on. You got the idea? We're going to look at the marvel of love. Uh, in this area of marveling, uh, I thought it was interesting that Dr. Griffith had mentioned in his message about uh, when you got saved, for instance... At salvation, there were some 33-plus things that took place like that, and you had no idea it was taking place. Uh, and uh, that was true, at least for most of us. We were not Bible scholars. I didn't know uh, all the ins and outs of Scripture. Here's what happened. When I was a sinner in need of, a sal of salvation, I knew that I just needed to ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I wanted to believe that Jesus died and paid the price for my sin and in faith, I, I cried out to Christ to save me from my sin. And in his, uh, in his grace and his mercy, he reached down and saved a soul like mine. And uh, did I understand at that point in time that I was given new life and that I was placed into the body of Christ and that I was uh, indwelt by the, the, the Holy Spirit of God, sealed into the day of redemption, forgiven, reconciled, on and on and on? I had no idea what God was doing. All I knew was I was a sinner in need of a Savior, and I asked Christ to be my Savior. So that's a marvel. You can look at that. Uh, you can look at the marvel, and here's another marvel I often look at. Being filled with the Spirit of God. Do you know what it really means to be filled with the Spirit of God? It means to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. And that is an exhortation that, that uh, God reminds us that we're all to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is to be filled and continue to be filled. And the reason that we are reminded of that truth is because we can lose the filling of the Holy Spirit. We don't lose the Holy Spirit. We lose the control of the Holy Spirit. When we allow the flesh uh, to control us, we're not walking under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so the flesh will do, do things and say things that, that are unpleasing to God. And it's all flesh. Don't blame God. But when we're under the control of the Holy Spirit, we wake up, we have our time in the Word, we pray, we ask God for that help, and we're sensitive and mindful of the presence of the Holy Spirit throughout the day. And so we, we again, guard our words, we guard our actions, we guard the places we go to, we guard the people that we associate with, if, if that is the need. All of those things under the control of the Holy Spirit. 
When you are under the control of the Holy Spirit, you will again find yourself as an individual speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. You will be making melody in your heart to the Lord. You will be giving thanks always for all things. And you'll be submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Now, again, when, you, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't, well, I need to be filled so I can do this. No, when you get filled, these are natural things that happen. So you can look at all that. I want to look at, again, the marvel of love here in this text. And, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of Ds that I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the definition, demonstration, de- demand, disclosure, declaration, and the distinctiveness of love. And see if you can follow all that. That would really be good. Let's go back to, again, the same verses that we're looking at here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Quickly. Here we go. We've looked at this, so we will not be overly redundant here. But again, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth not God. I want to remind you of this. You cannot love apart from God. Oh, you can have an element of love, but you cannot love to the degree that God wants you to love apart from God. It's just impossible because he says that here. Everyone that loveth is born of God, has this nature of God in them, enabling us to love. You know, God will never ask you to do things that he does not equip you to do. And so if he's going to tell us to love to the degree that he will in this text and other places in Scripture, he will ask us to do it because he will equip us to do that. And the equipment begins when we become a child of his, when we're birthed into his family, when we become born again, when we get saved. When we get saved, then we have this ability to love as he would have us to love. If you're here today without Christ, you need to get saved. You need to be born again. And uh, I'd be glad to explain all of that terminology. It's all biblical, but you need to understand I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. When you ask Christ to be your Savior, you're born into the family of God. You now have the ability to love. And it goes on and says here, and knoweth God. That's kind of interesting. Knoweth God here, real quick, that little phrase there talks about uh, an intensity of of God. Uh, Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. It's speaking of an intimate love for God. Somebody has described it this way. uh, We are to love so much that when one weeps, the other tastes salt. Think about that. I mean, have you ever entered into a time of of coming alongside of somebody whose heart is broken? I mean, uh, maybe they just lost a loved one. Maybe they're going through some very difficult times in their life and some major challenges or whatever it might be. and, And their heart is literally broken and their tears are just pouring off their eyes, and and you love that person so much that as they weep, you taste their salt from their eyes. Now, folks, that's talking about an intimate knowledge with a person that you, again, come alongside of love. And that's what he's trying to say. Hey, we have a responsibility to love one another. He that loves is born of God, and we have that kind of an intimate relation. We know God. And then he goes on to verse 8 and says, He that loveth not... Uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I want to give you the definition of love, and maybe I should have started with this a couple weeks ago, but I didn't. As already mentioned this morning, this word love appears 30 times in this one chapter alone, and God appears 29 times in chapter 4. So that's an awful lot of love and God in one chapter. Here's the definition, though. Love is really wrapped up in the essence of God. You want to know what love is? Know God. Let me begin by telling you what the world would tell us love is. The American Heritage Dictionary defines love as, here it is, listen, the intense affection for another person based on familial or personal ties. Again, the intense affection for another person based on familial or personal ties. Intense affection, what does that mean? Well, that is something that is not to be taken lightly. It is a strong, a very intimate, again, a very intense physical or emotional attraction. That's the idea, intense affection. But the American Heritage Dictionary goes on and says that it is based on, based on implies that it is conditional, that we love someone because they fulfill a condition uh, in our lives. They meet some kind of requirement. I love you because... You are good to me. I love you because you are fun to be with. You're meeting a need within my life, therefore I love you. That's the condition. But the Bible says that God is love. And when we really want to define love, then we need to know God. It's really dealing with the very essence of God. If you study God, 
you'll understand love. He is very different from human love. We're not talking about human love. We're talking about, we're talking about God. His love is unconditional, and it is not based on feelings or emotions. He doesn't love us because we are lovable people or that we make him feel good. God is God. It's, again, hard for us with our finite minds to really wrap it around who God is. But God is, is self-contained. God doesn't need you or me. He doesn't need any of us. Uh, God has existed long before you or I ever came into this world, and he will exist for all of eternity. He will list, uh, exist forever and ever and ever. So, so it, it behooves us to try to understand who is this God then, for in trying to understand God, we'll understand something more about this element of love. This love really has to do with the very essence, the very makeup of God. He is more than love, but he is love, and he created us to enter into a relationship of love. So if I want to know what love is, I need to know God, and in so knowing God, I'll know that I was created in his image and his likeness with the design to demonstrate love as he has demonstrated love to us. And so this love is really wrapped up in the essence of God. Now listen, God is a whole lot more than love. And by the way, let me just say this. Not all love is God, but God is love. There is a lot of love that is fleshly love. Uh, we're not talking about that, and don't blame God for the fleshly love. No, but God is love. It's, a, it's the very nature of God. You, you cannot separate love from God any more than you can separate the holiness from God or the justice of God or the grace of God or the mercy of God. God has all of that. And it's all part of his being. And so as I study God and look at God, I begin to understand what love is. And the Bible says simply here that God is love. So, so I would simply say, if you want a definition for what love is, say God. And I think you're okay. Uh, try to explain that to the world. Uh, you know, the world wants to know, hey, what is love? Well, it's God. It's God. That's not what the American Heritage Def Dictionary tells me. No, but I'm telling you what the Bible says. God is love. Study God, you'll know what love is all about. So love could simply be defined in the person of God, the very essence, the very nature of God. But, but to take it a little bit further, God demonstrated love to us. So, so this is the beauty of our God. Look at the very next verse. Uh, verse 9 tells us, In this, this element of love, this marvel of love, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son, that only begotten could be understood as one of a kind, his only begotten Son, into the world uh, that we might live through Him. What is verse 9 really telling us? It's really telling us about the demonstration of love. So let me give you this. So God didn't just sit in heaven or write a book and simply say God is love. No, as I told you, you study God, you'll understand what love is. And in studying God, you're going to understand that God loved and He gave. He demonstrated His love. How did He, how did he demonstrate His love? By giving. Uh, of course, we know that the greatest gift that God ever gave us was His Son. For God so loved the world, what did He do? That He gave. Exactly. So, here's it is. You want to love, you give. Somebody said this, folks. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. If you really say, I love others, or I love one another, or I love the brethren, the brethren, then listen, you will find yourself giving to the need of the brethren. You will find yourself, it might be, by the way, when I talk about giving, I'm not talking about necessary finances. It might be your time. It might be, it might be writing a letter. It might be a phone call. It might be encouraging. It might be praying. There's a lot of ways you can give. But listen, if you love the brethren, you'll give. That's just the way it is. That's the demonstration of love. God didn't sit in heaven and say, oh, I love you, I love your world, but you're lost and on your way to a Christless eternity and... Uh, that's your problem. No, God sat in heaven and looked at mankind, and he says, I love mankind. Therefore, I'm going to do something for mankind. I'm going to give. And what did he do? He gave us his very best. He gave us his son. Now, listen, we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes, but I want you to just understand this uh, for, for a second here. Uh, do you know what that really entailed with God giving us his son? 
Um, I'm going to try not to get overly emotional here on this whole thing here. But I want to tell you, we had a son recently that left our church family, uh, left at least here, and he, he went to France to study a language, and then he went from France, and he went to Madagascar. And, uh, and we won't see him but every four years. Now, I want to tell you something. Uh, we got about this much of a taste of what it's like to give your son to God. We really have. Now, you say, well, you know, your kids are scattered all over. That's true. That's true. But you know what? I can, I can, I can fly to Florida, Texas, Michigan, New York, or wherever I have to go to catch up with my kids tomorrow if I had to. If there was a big enough need or something really going on, or I can, uh, I can simply I can be there and I can catch up with them, and I also know that I will see them several times throughout the course of the year. But I want to tell you something. We had a son that left us because he was called of God to go to a mission field. And we don't talk about it. We don't brag about it. But I want to tell you something. We got a little bit of a taste of what it's like for a parent to give up a son. Not an easy thing to do. Do you think it was any different with our Heavenly Father? He loved his son. His son loved his father. They had a great relationship. They didn't have problems. It wasn't like, well, you just need to take a little trip. No, he loved his son. And because he loved his son and he loved us, he loved us, he gave us his son. He demonstrated that love. What an incredible demonstration of love. That's why I say, I, I want you to go home and just reflect on my love. Do I really love the brethren? If I love, I'm going to be finding myself giving. And what can I give? I can give my time. I can give my, my expertise. I can give my, my talents. I can give whatever I can do to help others out. That's loving the brethren. The Bible talks about this love in a number of ways. Uh, God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us. We read about it in Ephesians chapter 2. We could read it about in Romans chapter 5. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. How about, how about Jesus' love? Because that's, again, what the text is saying. In this was manifested, verse 9, the love of God. How was God's love made known to mankind? Well, it says because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. He demonstrated. He didn't just sit in heaven and say, I love you. He demonstrated it. Jesus likewise demonstrated his love for us, and we could look at a number of passages of Scripture dealing with the love of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, And walk in love as Christ also loved us, and hath given himself for us. Here's the beauty. So, so God loved, he gave. Jesus loved, he gave. What did he give? He gave his life. Father gave his son, son gave his life. So they didn't, this, this element of love, folks, is not just, oh, well. No, I know you know that Christ came to this earth. I know you know that he died. But listen, it's in this, um, under the umbrella of love is why he did it. We can look at another passage of Scripture dealing with Galatians chapter 2. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And it goes on and says this, And I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Over and over and over again we read about Christ and his love for us and him giving himself to us as a result. Look at verse 10 quickly here. The depth of love. How deep is this love? Well, herein is love. Again, we're studying about God. We're studying about love. I want to know more about it. We have the definition, God. We have the demonstration, gave. Verse, uh, verse 10 tells us the depth of this love. Here in his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us, look at this, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word, propitiation. Any idea what propitiation means? I would say satisfaction would be the idea. He, he, Jesus Christ became the satisfaction for our sins. You could read about this back in, uh, in uh, 1 John, same book, chapter 2, verse 2, where the Bible says, And he, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What, what does propitiation mean? It means that he completely satisfied the demands of a heavenly father for sin. Here's how it works. Soul that sinneth, die. That's what God said. He said to Adam and Eve, you eat, you die. God is a God of his word. He never minces his words. He means what he says, says what he means. When he said, Adam and Eve, you eat, you die, guess what? They ate, they died. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They died. Did they die immediately? No. They died immediately spiritually, physically, a number of years later. They would die. That's why death is in this world. Uh, so, so the penalty is sin brings about death. So every one of us really should be Separated from God for all of eternity because we're all born sinners. But God loved us. And he sent his son. And his son loved us and he died. And when he died, he became 
the complete satisfaction for the demands of sin. He died and took our sin, our penalty, upon him. He died in our place. Let, let me give you one example. In the book of Hebrews, you might understand this a little bit better. In the book of Hebrews chapter 9, it talks about this. This is kind of interesting. The word propitiation is translated mercy seat in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5. What is a mercy seat? Do you remember in the, uh, in the Old Testament days, in the tabernacle, there was the holy place, and there was the holy of holies, and inside of the holy place was one article of furniture, and it was really this mercy seat. And nobody could go behind that curtain except the high priest, and how often could he go behind that, that curtain? How often? He could go once a year. And it was on a very particular day, and it was called the what? The Day of Atonement. It was the Day of Atonement. And when he went into that place, what did he have to have with him? He better have blood with him. He better have blood. If he don't have blood, he's going to die in there. In fact, there was a lot of concern about him dying in there. So he'd go in there with blood. And what would he do with that blood? He would take that blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And what was that a picture of? That God, again, was going to cover the sin of his nation. Now, listen, that's not all flagrant sin. That's sins that are, were not necessarily known. That may be sins of those that are underage, a number of things along those lines that were involved in this Day of Atonement. But the picture is... That blood was being applied to the mercy seat to cover sin. Isn't that interesting that that's the very same word that's translated propitiation? In other words, when the high priest did that, he was satisfying a demand of God that sin be cared for by way of blood. Jesus came and completely satisfied his father by being the propitiation for our sins and shedding his blood on the cross for our sins. We're familiar with this verse, folks, here, but I want you to, again, take this to the depths of, of, uh, of love. How deep is this love? Oh, it is deep, folks. Here's the verse you're familiar with. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. What does that really mean that he commended his love toward us? It means that he exhibited or showed his love in an unusual or remarkable manner. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so... You'd say, okay, well, I get that. Let me put it in the context, okay? That's Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The verses that lead up to that, 6 and 7, kind of set the stage for what he's going to tell us in verse 8. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. The context tells us, for when we, that's us, Paul writes to these Roman individuals, these Roman believers, when we were yet without strength in due time, here it is, Christ died for the ungodly. Two things I see right away in that verse. Verse 6 says, we were without strength, that's spiritual strength, and ungodly, number two. Two things, verse 6, without strength, ungodly. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would some even dare to die. Folks, not only were we without strength and ungodly, we were not righteous and we were not good. But God commended his love toward us in that while I was in that state, without strength, ungodly, not righteous, not good, God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love in giving us his son to take care of our sin need. That's incredible, folks. The depth of this love is not just some fluffy feeling that you or I may entertain from time to time. Oh, no, it's beyond that. In, Roman, uh, in 2 Corinthians, you're familiar that God had made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Hard for us to imagine. Again, I, 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 can hardly ever, I can hardly ever pass that passage of Scripture without reminding you that that particular verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, is the greatest exchange that has ever taken place in all of human history. The greatest exchange that has ever taken place. God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin. You know Why? That verse goes on and says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here's the exchange. I gave all of my sin to God, and you know what God gave me? All of his righteousness. I got all of the righteousness of Christ applied to my account, and I simply gave him my sin. Can it, I mean, am I worthy? Am I deserving? Oh, so you're, you're, There's not a good enough person to receive that. And yet that's exactly what he did for us. An incredible exchange. Who knew no sin? You know, when Christ died on the cross, remember he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know why he cried out that, don't you? Why, why did Christ on the cross, one of those seven utterances that came from the cross, why did he cry out, My God, my God? He's talking to his father. Why hast thou forsaken me? 
That's when the sin burden of mankind was placed on, his, on the shoulders of Christ, that, that the father had to actually look away from his own son, who he loved dearly. But the Bible teaches in the book of Habakkuk that thou art a purer of eyes than to look on iniquity. God cannot look on sin. And so when the burden of sin was placed on his son, the father had to actually look away. And it broke the heart of Christ when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, he knew. But I want to tell you, he did it because he loved us. The depth of this love is incredible. Uh, so we have the definition, the declaration, the depth. How about the demand of love? Quickly look at verse 11 here. Beloved, here's that word again. We're right back into this idea of dealing with believers. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Hey, listen, if he loved us to that degree, don't you think it would behoove us to love the same? And it would, and it is, and it is a command, and it's not an option. Hey, listen, we really have a responsibility to love. So, so again, I know it was two weeks ago we talked on this subject. I just ask you, how well have you done in two weeks? That's just a short period of time. We're going to move beyond this chapter here, and we may forget about love for a little while here, but I ask the question, how well are you loving one another? If God so loved us to this degree, don't you think we ought to love others? And the answer to that is yes, it's rhetorical. There's no, not a lot of explanation needed there. Verse 12, quickly, how about this disclosure of love? No man has seen God at any time. That's true, with the exception of Christ. You or I have not seen God. I have not seen Him with my physical eyes. I've seen Him by way of my spiritual eyes, by way of the Word. I've not heard Him speak in an audible tone to me. You haven't either. I hear God speak to me by way of the Word of God. This is how God makes Himself known to mankind, the very Word of God. So God speaks, I hear, I see Him. But no man has seen God at any time. And then it goes on and says, uh, uh, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected or completed in us. Remember the context. It's dealing with love. So what is he trying to say here? Because mankind has not seen God, here's how he will perfect love or complete love. That completed, perfected love will be in your life and in my life as he indwells us. Therefore, as already indicated, God has no hands, he has no feet, he has no mouth. Now, I know Scripture affords those titles to God, but I want to remind you that is called an anthropomorphism. That means simply that God is, uh, they're applying terms to God so that we as mankind can understand God. We know what a mouth does, it speaks. We know what ears do, they hear. We know what hands do, they feel. So these terms are applied to God, but God is spirit. He doesn't have physical hands. But he can certainly do things because he is God. He hears, he sees, he knows all. That's God. But because God is spirit, he has given you and I the ability to reveal him to the world. And so how you use your hands, how you use your feet, how you use your mouth is a revelation to the world that the invisible God is visible through my life. So if the world wants to see God, they look at you, and they look at me, and we reveal God. So when they look at your life, what do they see? Do they see God? Now, folks, we're a long way from home. We are far from perfect. And I'm so thankful again for a gracious and merciful God who is, who is helping us, shaping us, molding us to be more like Christ. That's why I say today ought to be different than you were yesterday. And each day of our, of our lives, we get closer to Christ. We get more like Christ. But in the interim, even as imperfect a person as we are, we still reveal God to this world. Brother Griffith was talking about marriage the other day. And I thought that, again, it's just a good reminder because don't, I don't focus enough on that. Uh, I really don't focus on it in my own marriage. I don't focus on a lot of it on our preaching. But, you know, marriage is bigger than just two people coming together, uh, committing that marriage uh, by way of uh, sacred vows, and, uh, and then living the rest of their life. It's bigger than those two people. Marriage is really a picture of a love relationship that is far greater than our homes, far greater than our marriage. Here's the picture. When people see us, now I, I agree, my neighbors probably don't get this, but, but in due time they ought to. When they see my wife and I, living together the way God intended us to live together as a married couple, 
the picture that is painted is, not, is, is, is bigger than just, oh, well, they're a nice couple and they're happily married. No, the picture is there's a God in heaven who loves a bride as well, and that bride is his church. So there's a picture that is beyond just the marriage itself. Your life and your love is a demonstration to the, to the world that the invisible God has been revealed. And that's exactly what he's trying to say here in verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. That's true. You go to your neighbor. Have you seen God? No. You could say, then look at my life. Now, that's pretty bold to do. But you could really, in essence, say that. You could really say, I'll show you God. Watch how I live as your neighbor. Watch how I live or how I work as a co-worker. Watch how I interact with my, my fellow students or my fellow workers. Watch how I act. Because as I interact and live, I want you to see God. That's what I want you to see. And again, it's under this umbrella of love because he goes on and says in that verse, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And here it is, his love is completed. It, it works out to the fullest degree. Uh, this, is, uh, this is some really interesting uh, things uh, with regard to all of that. Um, we're not gonna, I'm looking at the clock here and realizing we're not going to get too far here. If we were to summarize, though, just verses 7 through 12, just these, these uh, first six verses here, what would we understand? Well, we can understand or summarize these first six verses from 7 to 12 as love originating in God manifest it by way of his son, and demonstrate it by way of his people. Love originates with God, demonstrate it by way of the greatest gift, giving us his son, and demonstrate it by way of his people. If we stop there, I would hope and pray that that would be enough for you to look on and think on. It goes on in verses 13 to 16 here, if we can go through quickly maybe. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. How do I know that... I am a child of God. You know, there are people that go through life and they probably wonder, am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? Am I not saved? Well, listen, there are some really clear evidences of salvation in Scripture. I don't think God ever wants you to go through life confused because I really believe confusion is out of the pit of hell. It is not from God. God is not an author of confusion. So when there's confusion in your life or my life, I'm telling you, it's not from God. God is very clear. God does, again, he, God, it's black or white. There's no gray with God. It's very, very clear with God. When it comes to the matter of salvation, could there be an issue that is any more important than knowing for sure that I am right with God through faith in Jesus Christ and that if I were to die, I have a, an eternal uh, destination of heaven, that when I die, I will be in heaven? Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's anything more important. Um, Steve and I were talking about his, his mother's passing and and uh, Steve and I have talked for some time about his mother and his grandmother. His grandmother lived to be in her 90s, and now her, his mother passed away at 78 maybe or something like that. I said, is she saved? And uh, Steve, like myself, can only hope. We don't have, we don't have real rock-solid assurance that she was saved. I, I, I don't know. And, it's, and I say I can identify with Steve because my father passed into eternity a number of years back. Shell's mother. Her father passed away as well, but I'm pretty sure pretty sure I'm going to see her dad. I'm pretty sure we're going to see my father-in-law in heaven. And I, and I know that because two weeks before he, got, before he left this world, he asked Jesus to be a Savior. And it wasn't just a quick prayer to just get his son-in-law off his back, but I think it was pretty clear. Um, without prompting my father-in-law, I remember him talking to our daughters when they were in school down in Florida. And he, he initiated the conversation by telling my daughters in Florida that, hey, I just got saved. Now, I want to tell you, when an when a person who, who has not been saved starts talking like that, there is obvious evidence that, that something is going on. And the terms that he used were terms that come right out of Scripture. So I, and we weren't even there. We were not in the room. We didn't hear that. Our daughters relayed that to us. So I say that, and I say I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to see my father-in-law. So I say that to say salvation. It, it's critical. Don't go through life wondering, am I or am I not? Some of the evidences that we have is the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. And that's what verse 13, hereby know we that we dwell in God. We dwell in him. How do we know that? Well, he tells us because he hath given us his spirit. 
The Holy Spirit has taken up residence. And you know what the Bible says? The Spirit of God beareth witness with my spirit that I'm a child of His. The Spirit has brought confirmation to me that I know I'm saved. And it's not because I'm better or greater. It's just that I know that there was a time I was lost and I got found. I was blind and now I see. I was a child of darkness and I'm a child of light. I know when, where it was, and I know exactly the prayer I prayed. I could, I could reiterate that whole scenario. I know there was a definite time in my life where I asked Christ to save me. And when that took place, the Spirit of God came in me, and he flooded my soul. And, folks, you've heard testimonies like this over and over again. I remember driving away, and I really felt that I was floating along on cloud nine. And you hear all oh, people say, no, listen, that was true. I knew something was different about that day. And I'm not just talking about emotional hype or some kind of experience. I know exactly what took place that day. And since that day, the Spirit of God has gone on and confirmed it over and over and over again. Well, in this text, he tells us, hey, listen, those that are his will have the presence, the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. And it goes on and tells us in the very next verse here, verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Part of this, part of this uh, knowing for sure that we are a child of God is the desire to tell other people the truth that God the Father sent the Son into the world because the world has a problem with sin. That's what he's saying in verse 14. We've seen and we're testifying that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Listen, evidence. Again, so I only just say this for a couple of reasons, because if we just talk about the Spirit of God indwelling you, you say, well, I, I think the Spirit of God dwell, indwells me. Well, you, you should know for sure. Here, here's more evidence. Do you have a desire to tell other people that the Father sent the Son into the world to be the Savior? Uh, I mean, uh, do, you, do you share that truth? Why is that important? Well, because that's what the Spirit of God is going to prompt you to do. Because, again, you are to be light and salt in this world. And, and part of that is sharing Christ with people that desperately need to hear. Whosoever shall confess, there's the word, confess, that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we know and believe the love uh, that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. And so, again, in the context of love, listen, I have the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. I, I enjoy telling others about the need uh, or the, uh, about the Savior. And I also have this love in my heart for the brethren. And, uh, and, and I can honestly stand before you and say there isn't, you know, there isn't somebody that I, I wouldn't reach out to or reach down to or help up or to love if that need was there. I, I, I don't want to hold grudges. I don't want to be bitter. All the things we talked about a couple weeks ago. And so I truly have a desire for loving the brethren. And all of those things, again, give clear evidence as to my salvation in Christ. Well, we could go on and develop some of these things here, folks, and it looks like we're not going to get to, and um, there's some, some big passages coming up. I want to close with this, this, uh, this illustration I read, and I, I think I printed it on the copy machine, but forgot to pick it up off my, copy, my printer at home. Um, so I didn't get it, but I'll, I'll, give you the, uh, I'll give you the rendition of this and something that you can all identify with. It. The article is really good because what I read dealt with the specifics. But here's what you and I can identify with. All of us have heard of the Titanic, the unsinkable ship. Hit the big uh, iceberg, opened up a huge hole in that unsinkable ship, and within a very short period of time, that ship went down. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. There were not enough life vessels, life uh, uh, boats on that ship to, con to, to put all the people in as the ship was going down. I think I read there were only 20 lifeboats on that ship. Surely outmanned. And, I, and now look at, by the way, uh, uh, if you look at these cruise ships, you look at it, uh, probably the laws and the regulations have now made it mandatory that depending on how many people you put on those things, you must have enough vessels so that all of them, they could all be rescued, and maybe they learned from things like the Titanic. Okay, so here's what I understand. I think there were only 20. In the 20 vessels that got off the ship and rescued a number of people, not all of those 20 vessels were full to the capacity. In other words, those vessels could have hosted more people, but they didn't. So we got six, seven, eight, I don't know, uh, I don't know how many, 10 people, 12 people, I don't know how big they were, but let's just say we got 12 people in. Maybe they were designed to hold 16 people. But out of concern for themselves, what did they do? They pushed away as fast as they could. 
I got enough. Let's get out of here. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All they were concerned about was themselves. Of the 20 vessels that get off, those people, uh, they, they survived. But here's what's interesting. Other people were going down and clinging to any kind of uh, article, uh, piece of the boat that they could to. They had some life jackets on, but because of the temperature of the water, hypothermia set in, and they were going to succumb to that in a short period of time. Picture yourself. I'm in a lifeboat, pushed off, and I hear the cries of people all around me. I hear, I hear fellow passengers, people that maybe I got to meet in the dining hall, people I've just met and have enjoyed, and I hear them crying out, help, help, save me, help. You have room in your boat. What are you going to do? You would think, out of 20 vessels, one boat went back. Out of 20, I, I believe they are all numbered. I believe it was boat number 14, life vessel, whatever you want to call them. 14 went back to help rescue a few extra people. Why did the other 19 not go back? I can tell you why. Well, they were afraid. If their boat went back, they were afraid gobs of people would try to get into that vessel and ultimately take that vessel down, and they would drown as well. So in my reading, and again, I, 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 I didn't do fact check, so, but here's, it's, a, it's a powerful illustration. The other 19 were saying, we got room, but if I go back, I only have room for four or five more people, but 15 people might want to get in my boat, and now I'm going to sink with them. You know what? We'll just stay away. But one of those vessels said, no, no, we're going to go back. I don't know how many people boat number 14 rescued. I don't know how many, but here's the beauty of it. Not a one person in boat number 14 drowned. Not a one person. They all made it. You know, there's a picture of mankind. That is, that, that is mankind. We are wrapped up in our world. It's about me, my survival. Folks, now listen. I understand it humanly. I would, I would be wrestling in that boat. I really would. If my wife and my kids were in that boat, I'd be, I, I would be struggling. I'm not going to stand here and make it sound like I want to be boat. I, I don't know. I would hope I would have been boat 14. Humanly, I understand that. I fear if I, we go back, what's going to happen? Not to mention, maybe we'll hit some of that debris that's now in the ocean and cut our raft, and now we go, and now we just lost. So you can play out that scenario to the degree you want to, but here's what I do know. I sure appreciate people in boat number 14. They truly had a love for other people. They wanted to do what they could do. They wanted to help them out and rescue them. And you know what? God, again, in his infinite grace, allowed all those people in that boat to survive. Uh, listen, I could be completely off base. I read it. I'll give you the story. I'll give you the history of it and all that kind of stuff. But it plays into where we are here. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And he that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. You want to know more about love? Study God. See how he demonstrated that love. Understand the depth and the gravity of, or the, the, the depth of this love. Incredible, incredible love. And that's what he calls us to do as well. The marvel of love. And you can read the rest of the love, it's, uh, the chapter, as far as how it's perfected and the fear is gone and things of that sort. But um, for the sake of time, we'll call it quits there. I trust the Lord will bless you as you study and understand about this area of love. And I, here's, here's my prayer. You know, I hope we didn't just fill up a Sunday. You know, well, it was another Sunday. I went to church. Oh, God help us. I really, I hope we leave here differently today than we came. And I hope we leave differently in the sense that God, help me. Help me. I want to be obedient to your word. I want to love to that degree. That's what you're asking me to do. And, Lord, you're not going to ask me to do something you won't equip me to do. So, Lord, help me to truly love people that way. If you and I could do that, then our time was well spent this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's thank the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word.